for uh, for sticking it out to oh there we go sticking it out to the very end and um, and being here for uh, I guess to uh, I would say to to share with me um, I was in my in my last couple of years of rabbinical school, um, I had this odd job of being a reference librarian at the library at the American Jewish University. And, um, you know, that title reference librarian makes it sound, I think, a little bit more uh, maybe glamorous than it really was, because um, it mostly involved helping undergraduates find books that they needed, um, that their, um, you know, the professors had assigned them some kind of a project Hmm? Okay, I think putting the light behind me makes it worse. Ooh, I know, please turn that back off. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, so I had this job that most of the time involved, um, most of the time involved helping undergraduates figure out where to find the books that they needed to write the papers that they were only mildly interested in. Um, but every so often, because the AJU library had um, the, it was the largest Judaica collection on the West Coast, um, you know, we get all kinds of phone calls from people with questions. Um, but what I'll never forget was the day somebody called and wanted to know the origin of playing dreidel on Hanukkah. Um, and I, I can't take any credit. It was, um, it was Rabbi Pat Fenton, who's a, a wonderful colleague and a good friend who uh, found the answer in, um, you know, you may not have heard, it's a very obscure reference, uh, but a, a, a little known book called The Jewish Book of Why by Alfred Kolach. This was where I learned that sometimes when you're researching an obscure topic in Jewish thought that, um, you know, if you look in a very widely published and well-known book um, published for a popular audience, sometimes the answer you need is right there. Um, and what emerged from that was um, this custom that had developed sometime in the 16th century of people playing games for about, uh, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes after the candle lighting. People would light their Hanukkah candles and then they would play games as a kind of an amusement pastime. And we know that this started in the 15th century. Um, but because before that time, you don't have any rabbis who are writing uh, angry letters trying to ban the practice of game playing on Hanukkah after lighting the Hanukkah candles, um, presumably because people weren't doing it. As soon as people started doing it, um, through to the 20th century, you have rabbis who are trying to stamp the practice out to no avail. Um, and dreidel, it turns out, uh, was a very popular game in 17th century Germany where you would spin a four-sided top, and if it landed on Gruss, you would take the entire pot. If it landed on Halb, you would take half. If it landed on Nisht, you got nothing. And if it landed on Stett, you had to put one in. Does this start to sound familiar to people? So, um, but the but the point of this is not to demystify dreidel. The point of this is um, that dreidel was just happened to be a game that was popular in 16th century Germany, and when it lost its appeal, which um, you know, I don't know about you, but for me it does after about seven minutes, um, Jews somehow latched onto this game. Um, I, I blame the rabbis who may have found a way of, you know, of um, koshering the whole business of game playing by saying, oh, there's this one kosher game. Um, but there were other games. People would play all kinds of other games. Uh, so it said that there was uh, one year on one of the nights of Hanukkah, um, Reb Nachum of Shtepanesh, who was one of the sons of the original Rebbe, comes into the Beit Midrash one night after the Hanukkah candle lighting, and all of the Hasidim are are sitting around playing checkers. And Reb Nachum uh, comes downstairs from uh, from his home, which was above the Beit Midrash. And he enters the Beit Midrash and he sees all the tables, all the svarim are put away and the tables are covered and everybody's playing checkers. And he, he yells to the Hasidim, he says, do you know what you're doing? And there's, and there's silence and terror in the room. And after a pause, Reb Nachum says, uh, since it seems you don't know what you're doing, I'll tell you how to play this game. So do you move 
you move one space at a time. You move, you always move forward and you never move backward. Sometimes you give up a piece in order to take a piece. And when you reach the other side, you can go in whichever direction you want. So, so we'll start there. Um, and I, and I would love to hear from anyone who's uh, willing to venture. What is, what is the, what do you hear in the story? What does that story tell you or what, or what, to what part of you does that story speak? Phyllis? Yes, to me it says, if you're gonna do it, you might as well do it right. The importance of accuracy and detail and taking something seriously. Okay, good. So, so there's something to be said for taking it seriously. Uh, do you think, I'm just gonna put you on the spot because you raised your hand. I, uh, do you think the Hasidim actually didn't know how to play checkers? Uh, they may have been careless. They may have been lackadaisical. Not, not serious, and, or maybe the rabbi perceived them as people who were not careless and may not know the rules. Uh, there would, wasn't there a dichotomy or a tension between the, the uh, Hasidim and the, the uh, Gaon of Vilda's followers uh, rules versus the looseness of the Hasidim that they rejected? So the, maybe the, uh, the rabbi was assuming that the Hasidim probably didn't really know the rules or didn't pay attention to the rules. Okay, so, so maybe he's concerned that they're sitting there moving the pieces around, but they're not really playing checkers or they're not, or they're not playing the right way. Not playing the right way. All right, does anybody else wanna weigh in on that, on that question? What, is it, what does it mean that the Rebbe comes in and starts to tell people the rules of checkers? Yeah, I think that there's a deeper meaning to it. I think he's saying that, like, I'm not really sure how to put this. You, once you dedicate yourself to something and you're set on doing it, you can only do that thing. You can't decide it's too hard and then go backwards. But once you get to the other side, once that task is completed, you can go wherever you want. And sometimes in order to, for the greater good, for this goal, you have to sacrifice other things. Okay. I think that's what he's trying to say. Thank you. Other, other reflections on the story, um, but what, what, what part of you woke up to this story? I heard it as a bit more humanizing that there was a time to just enjoy being and and that he was engaging with them with with the rest of the community in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's um, I, he didn't sit down to play checkers, but he's he's offering some part of himself, um, you know, a, an endorsement or a or a joining or or some kind of a connection with the Hasidim to say like um, you're not the only ones who know how to play checkers, right? Like I also know what this game is and how it works. Tanya, anything else you wanted to add? Um, not that I've put in words yet. <laughs> That's okay. But. Um... Yeah, because you expect as he walks in, I'm trying to think it through, um, you know, like, oh, everybody's going to hide their shame that he might have caught them. And and there's just such a juxt juxtapositioning of him, like, well, here here it is. I know about this. And 
and he didn't say it's okay now do it or but he kind of did he's you know do it here's some ways and um yeah that's i think as far as i can go right now with that well yeah well yeah and there's um I think he's inviting them in a sense to to think differently about what they're doing, right? There's um there's also a bringing it out of of being in hiding and kind of yeah, that's an interesting something thing. when you bring it into the light. That's an interesting dynamic because of course they weren't hiding it at all until he walked in the room. Right. Then all of a sudden they're caught, right? There's that moment of we're going to be in trouble for this. Mm -hmm. um, and and instead, he asks them. I don't know, you know, if you you can kind of give me a thumbs up if you've had this experience where where someone has asked you to take yourself more seriously than you had been taking yourself. Mm -hmm. um, which, like, there have been times where I felt that way that um, you know, where where someone a, a mentor, a teacher has has sat me down to say, look, like you're not, you're not taking yourself seriously enough. You're not, um, you know, and that, um, and, and there's a way in which he's saying to them, like, you think that you're killing time. You think that you're sitting here playing a game and enjoying yourself and having a half hour of frivolity because you lit the Hanukkah candles and you're not supposed to work while the Hanukkah candles are burning. Um, but actually you're, you're doing something and you're doing something real. And there's, um, there's a way of life that's encoded in the game. Mm -hmm. Abe, did you want to weigh in? Uh, yeah. It reminds me of the Buddhists saying, you, you know, don't look down on medial, medi, uh, you know, uh, tests that look frivolous. If you're washing dishes, put your consciousness into it as if you're washing the baby Buddha. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's very true. I think it's very true to what he's, um, to what he's saying, right? It's like, be, be fully invested in what you're doing. Um, and I think he's also, of saying something that's maybe the inverse of that Buddhist teaching, then I don't know if there's a parallel teaching in the Buddhist tradition, but um, but also to recognize that nothing, no, nothing just is without another meaning, right? And so, um, right, the, the basic rules of checkers, that you move one space at a time, you move forward and not back. Um, the strategy sometimes requires you to sacrifice a piece in the interest of the greater game. And when you get to the other side, you know, they king your piece by putting a second one on top and then you can move all over. Um, he's talking about that as a paradigm of, of spiritual growth. Right? The, the Rebbe's not actually interested in checkers at all. Um, except insofar as it's it's an it's a a way of framing a, a model of spiritual growth that is incremental and evolutionary and um, and and progressive. Um, and, and and is predicated on this sense that. That, that nothing just is, right? That it's not, um, there's, no, there's no fate or coincidence or random circumstance that leads to a certain situation, that there's, um, there's intention and direction in the universe. Um, there's, um, So I saw something um, earlier today in um, in Psalm 22, which is um, perhaps not uh, familiar to you because it was not familiar to me, um, ex except insofar my um, 
my rabbi likes to say that um, yeshiva students know Tanakh to the extent that it's quoted in the Gemara and Midrash. And um, right, so guilty as charged. Uh, and so, it's, uh, you know, here's one, uh, if it doesn't appear in the Siddur, um, so I've encountered this um, really only through Midrash. And this morning was uh, the first time that, uh, this morning after Minyan was the first time that I really took the time to sit down and, and kind of read Psalm 22, read it through. Um, so uh, I'm going to take a moment now. I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read from Robert Alter's translation. Um, if you have a Tanakh, I invite you to welcome it and read along. Um, but I'm just going to read straight through so we can get a sense of the the progression. And it begins, "Lamnatzech al ayelat hashachar mizmor la David." Lamnatzech to the conductor, or uh, as Alter has it, to the lead player. On Ayelet HaShachar, um, Ayelet HaShachar literally means the gazelle of dawn um, and is a, a term that refers to the, that, that first kind of clear light that you see before the orb of the sun is really visible above the horizon. Uh, to the lead player on Ayelet HaShachar, a David psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my rescue are the words that I roar. My God, I call out by day and you do not answer. By night, no stillness for me. And you, the Holy One, enthroned in Israel's praise, in you did our fathers trust. They trusted and you set them free. To you they cried out and escaped. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and no man a disgrace among men by the people reviled. All who see me do mock me. They curl their lips, they shake their head. Who turns to the Lord, he will set them free. He will save him for he delights in him. For you drew me out from the womb, made me safe at my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth, from my mother's belly you were my God. Do not be far from me, for distress is near, for there is none to help. Brawny bulls surrounded me. The mighty of Bashan encompassed me. They gaped with their mouths against me, a ravening, roaring lion. Like water I spilled out. All my limbs fell apart. My heart was like wax, melting within my chest. My palate turned dry as a shard, and my tongue was annealed to my jaw, and to death's dust did you thrust me. For the curs came all about me, a pack of the evil encircled me, they bound my hands and feet. They counted out all my bones, it is they who looked, who stared at me. They shared out my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. But you, O oh Lord, be not far, my strength to my aid, O oh hasten. Save from the sword my life, from the cur's power my person. Rescue me from the lion's mouth, and from the horns of the ram you answered me. Let me tell your name to my brothers, in the assembly let me praise you. Fearers of the Lord, O oh praise him, all the seed of Jacob revere him, and be afraid of him, all Israel's seed. For he has not spurned, nor has he despised the affliction of the lowly, and has not hidden his face from him. When he cried out to him, he heard. For you, my praise in the great assembly, my vows I fulfill before those who fear him. The lowly will eat and be sated. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. May you be of good cheer forever. All the far ends of earth will remember and return to the Lord. All the clans of the nations will bow down before you. For the Lord's is the kingship, and he rules over the nations. Yes, to him will bow down all the netherworld sleepers. Before him will kneel all who go down to the dust, whose life is undone. My seed will serve him. It will be told to the master for generations to come. They will proclaim his bounty to a people aborning, 
for he has done. So I'm, I'm interested to know uh, how you experienced that psalm. The arc is very interesting um, in the sense that it's, on the one hand, it's a classic psalm of lament, right? There's this, um, the, the, the poet, the speaker is in distress and is, um, is feeling abandoned. Um, and, and yet there's this, there's this superscription, the, the apparent tone of the setup for the psalm um, suggests dawn. Um, right, this is a psalm of, of dawning that it seems to express great distress. Um, and so there's, um, I, you know, I wasn't kidding before when I said um, I mostly know Tanakh by its appearance in Midrash. Um, so there is, there is a Midrash uh, that begins, quoting from the Psalm of Psalms, um, who is this that peaks out like the dawn? And the Midrash tells us Rabbi Chia Bar Abba and Rabbi Shimon ben Chalafta were walking uh, at dawn in the Valley of Arbel, uh, which is a, a place you can go and hike in Israel today. Um, and so they're walking, they're taking a dawn walk through the Valley of Arbel. Um, they saw the, the dawn gazelle um, who's light was breaking, breaking out to rise. And um, Rabbi Chia said to Rabbi Shimon, Kach hi shal Yisrael. This is going to be the way of the redemption of the Jewish people. And Rabbi Shimon responds, um, right, you're right. And I'm going to prove it to you from Tanakh. I'm going to prove it to you from the text. Um, as I sit in darkness, God is my light. Um, at the beginning, it comes just bit by bit, tiny little bit by tiny little bit. And then it begins to break or to splinter, and it comes faster. And then it, uh, it is um, fruitful and it multiplies. Um, and then afterward, it becomes ever more glorious. And so Rabbi Shimon continues with his, with his Midrash. Um, Thus at the beginning, Mordechai Yeshev Bashar HaMelech. Mordechai sat in the king's gate. And then, when the king sees Esther come into the throne room, and then uh, Haman takes the garments and the royal horse, and he has to lead Mordechai around. Um, and then, Haman, and then they hang Haman. And then um, the king says to Esther and to Mordechai, Vatem kit vu al uh, write a decree to the Jews, write a decree to the Jews, give them the instructions that you want to give them. Mordechai comes out from the presence of the king dressed in the royal robes. And finally, la Yehudim hayta ora, the Jews had light. Um, so I, you know, there's enough familiar faces here that I know a lot of you have heard me say this before. There's, um, 
everything's intentional in Midrash. Um, these aren't the only verses. If, if Rabbi Chia Bar Abba is going to say the dawn is a paradigm for redemption, these aren't the only verses in the entire Bible that Rabbi Shimon ben Chalafta could have chosen to bring forward. It's, uh, Esther is not the only story of redemption. Um, so he's inviting us, he's inviting us into a question of what, what is it about Esther? Why, why her? And, and why her here in this Midrash? And, and why her are we talking about Purim on Shavuot night? Um, who does who does she represent to you? Who do you see when you see Esther? I see Sarah. Ruth. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. One second, Sherry. You have to unmute. No. Um, I mean, I mean Esther. Well, I mean, she can be like a Moshe figure, right? As a representative, like an ambassadorial figure, um, right? I mean. I mean, right is like one possibility. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's what you're going for. Um, I mean, right, I mean, she's definitely negotiates like a relationship between like a more powerful figure, um, right, and a people. You're basically, okay. so she's an intermediary. She's an intermediary figure between the Jewish people and a figure of authority. So, um, right, on the one hand, in the way that we were talking about Moshe when we were learning with Rabbi Annie, um, but also in the way that when we were learning with Anne, there's this whole question about um, where the Jewish people fit into the body politic of the Persian Empire. Um, and, and the question, I mean, the climactic question of the Megillah is, do they fit in at all? Um, or is there no place for them in the Persian Empire and they need to be eradicated? Right? So, so on both of those levels, spiritually and politically, um, Esther is an intermediary trying to navigate or negotiate those tensions. And, and like, and also sort of telling, I mean, like with, I mean, with Mordecai's help, but also like sort of telling the Jewish people who they are kind of in the process, right? I mean, like anytime like a people has to figure itself out, like vis via another people, right? It's, right, it has to solidify an identity or just even how it's going to represent itself, right, how, right, in that process of negotiation. So, right, it's like any time that's kind of a sharpening or like, an, right, an identity sculpting moment. Okay, good. So she has also even an internal, um, an internal function of, of identity defining, I don't think Anne's still on, but I would love to know what she thinks of this question, right? Of like, to what extent is the, um, the act of claiming one's place in the body politic an act of self-definition as much as it is an attempt to define oneself within the larger uh, sphere of what's happening? Um, Jake? So I think Ruth, because when you think about it, they both contribute greatly to Israel and the Jewish nation. Because Esther obviously saves everybody. And when you think of Ruth, like from her descends like the Davidic line, like Mashiach ben David is going to be a descendant of David and by way of Ruth. So, also, there are two of the, there are two of a very small club of female heroines. Because we have maybe ten 
you know, active female characters in the entire Tanakh that I know of. And when you think of Esther and Ruth, you think of someone, you also think of someone who was low in the community. Like Esther was, Mordechai was basically, he wasn't very wealthy and Esther was living with him. And then she gets taken to the palace. She gets elevated to the queen. And when you think of Ruth, Ruth originally was an outsider. She was a Moabite. And then she famously says, your God is my God. Where I go, where you go, I go. And she marries Boaz. She's really the first person to convert to Judaism. And she, she rises up to and Boaz is a very wealthy person, just like the king. She rises up from this kind of lower status to a, you know, higher place. We're, we're going to come back to Ruth because uh, Ruth, Ruth is going to have some important things to teach us about Esther. Um, I want to, Phyllis, I know you wanted to weigh in on this. You want to tell us a little bit about who Esther is for you? Yeah, I'm seeing it differently. I'm uh, Ruth of uh, Esther, rather, maybe a Jewish every woman. She was kind of pushed in or or followed Mordecai's suggestion to compete for the the marriage position. She went along with everything, but when it was time to act, when it was time to rise to the occasion, she did. And it may show that we all have the potential when we're in the position where we can count and make a difference. We too can rise to the position. She's not a strategist like some of the other uh, uh, Jewish, uh, the feminine female uh, leaders or f figures. Um, she was the right person. She was in the right place at the right time, but she actually was able to meet the situation. It's like Abraham Lincoln. Did the time make the man or did the man make the time? All right. Well, I, I want to, I want to come back. I want to come back to that thought about Esther in a minute, uh, but I want to hear what Abe has to say. Abe. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I looked up what does Esther mean? And it might mean Myrtle in Persian, but it also might mean star. You know, you were talking about light before and the two mm -hmm. rabbis. Yeah. So there's a glimmer of light in this terrible situation that's going to be. It might be. Okay, good. So, so is she even representing light that emerges from darkness uh, in, in, the, in the, the very etymology of her name? That's, that's, that I didn't know. That's really terrific. Um, anyone, anyone else want to share some of, um, of who Esther is for you? Um, and then I'm going to circle back to Phyllis's question in just a second. Hmm? What would you like to say, Rebecca? Um, I always think of like an element of hiddenness. Of hiddenness. Okay, so Rebecca's bringing up also there's a Hebrew etymology to the name of Esther, um, and the Hasidim make a big deal about this, Esther uh, with the Hebrew word hester, meaning concealment. Um, and right, and of course, and she is the one who is instructed to obscure her identity, right? She hides who she really is until she then has to reveal it. Um, Phyllis or, or anybody else, do you remember what Esther actually says when Mordechai comes to her and tells her about Haman's decree? Oh, she says she's not allowed to go in unless she's, until she's called. She's not allowed to go into the king uh, that it, it, uh, she could be put to death coming yeah, when she's she says, I didn't, she says, I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted ball gowns and petting children and, and public appearances. 
I didn't sign up to have to risk my neck to save the entire Jewish people. Like that's not what being the queen is all about. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating study in, in leadership in times of crisis. Um, because she says something, she says out loud something that I think anyone in a position of leadership in a time like we are living through has felt. It's like, I didn't bargain for this. This isn't why I went into X field. Right? And, and I'm not sure that there's a field that somebody hasn't thought to themselves, this isn't what I signed up for. Um, I, I mean, I, I'll say it honestly, like I, I, I signed up for having a synagogue where I can hug people and talk to people and be in a room with people. And right, I mean, like, like this, what we're doing right now and looking at, at all of you in, in your neat orderly boxes on the screen of my laptop that I can't quite believe is open on Yuntif, I didn't sign up for this. I, and, I have, and I have my moments of that. And, and then we get to what Phyllis is talking about. She rises above it. Right. Um, but there too, and this is, um, this is the end of chapter four in Migilat Esther. Um, there's, because there's a moment like, um, like Reb Nachum, there's a moment where Mordechai has to say to her, you're more than, you're more than ball gowns and crowns. Like he, he has to compel her to take herself seriously enough to rise to the occasion. Um, and, the, and the power of his conviction is so incredible. I'm starting from verse 13 here. Um, and, and Mordechai, um, it's, there's a bunch of, of eunuchs who are kind of playing errand boy between the two of them. They're not actually able to speak face to face because Mordechai is wearing sackcloth and mourning garments and um, you know among the arcane rules of Persian court is that you can't wear mourning clothes in the castle so he has to stay outside and these servants are going back and forth uh, then Mordechai told them to reply to Esther do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews and let that sink in for a second because no one in the palace knows that she's Jewish Right, as Rebecca was saying before, she's completely erased her identity. No one knows who she is. Um, and, and multiple times the, the Megillah tells us that she wouldn't say where she was from and she wouldn't say who her people was. Um, but Mordechai says, don't think that you're gonna escape in there any more than the rest of us. You're, you're literally sleeping in the bed of power in the castle and nobody knows who you are, and you're still not safe from the fate that awaits the rest of us. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And that, that's Mordechai, that's Mordechai saying to her, uh, what I said, this is your moment. This is, and, and, and when it says this is your moment, like this is, this is your moment. Like you, there's no one else. Right? You're the person. Um, and it's not, it's not an accident, right? It wasn't like the dumb luck that you got picked on, uh, on Persia's next top model. Um, and it's, you know, and it's not uh, the, the random circumstance of your birth that you look the way you look and the king took a liking to you, right? Uh, but there's, there's, there's direction and meaning in the universe. And, and you, right, and, and, and it's this, I've never quite been able to figure out what he's doing there, because on the one hand, he says to her, 
if you try to duck this, we'll get saved some other way. And on the other hand, he says to her, it's you. It has to be you. Um, you know, I remember, um, Rebecca, do you remember Noah Goldstein when we were in Israel? He was a part of Israel, yeah. So we, um, when we were in Israel, when we were expecting our oldest child, we, um, we hosted a, a Havdalah in Kiddush Lebanon, in our apartment once a month. Um, and there were a couple of different people taught and then we had a baby and we stopped doing it. I think we probably had fantasies in our head that we would keep doing it after we had the baby. And then we found out what parenthood was actually like and it discontinued. Um, but I remember so clearly the night that, um, that, uh, this guy, Noah Goldstein taught, um, and he taught about Moshe and he taught about Moshe's quality of anava, which gets translated into English as humility, which is why we don't actually understand what we're talking about when we're talking about Moshe's anava. Um, because we read humility as meekness and, and passivity. Um, and, that, and that can't be what it meant for Moshe um, because Moshe had enough chutzpah to let himself into the home of the most powerful man on earth at the time and give him instructions and start barking orders. Well, I mean, if you, you know, if you can imagine such a thing that you barge into the White House and you start telling the President of the United States what he is and isn't going to do. Um, and, and that was Moshe. So whatever Anava is, it has, we have to be able to reconcile that with the kind of person who's going to boss around the most powerful political leader on the planet. Um, and, and Noah's insight was to say that Anava is not the humility of saying, oh, no, I'm not worthy. It couldn't be me. But Anava is about the clarity of knowing when it's not your place to be trying to run things so that you know for sure when it is. And that second piece is the piece that gets missed in Anava. Like, yes, we should know Right? We should know enough not to be the person who's always raising their hand. We're reading Harry Potter now with the kids, right? And so there's that like bit with Hermione Granger in the early books where every question that everyone asks, Hermione's hand is always in the air. Right? So, so okay, we shouldn't be Hermione Granger. But the reason why Anava asks us to to sit and be quiet when it's not our turn is so that we will know when it is our turn. And so that we'll be able to act in the way that Esther finds in herself. Um, and, and Ruth, so now we can come back to Ruth, um, who, uh, if you're not familiar, um, Ruth is, is kind of the, the heroine of Shavuot. Um, because the, her Megillah is the one that we'll read on Saturday. Um, you know, and, and the book opens with such tragedy and dislocation um, that um, Elimelech, uh, uh, Naomi goes with um, her husband Elimelech and they move from Judah to Moab which is like, uh, you know, moving to Canada, like it was right across the border. And um, her sons marry these Moabite women, and then her husband dies, and then her sons die. And widowed Naomi, who is so disconsolate that she changes her name to Mara, which means bitterness. Um, she says, I'm packing up and I'm going back. And she turns to her daughters-in-law and she says, I have nothing for you. Go home. Go back to your parents. I have nothing for you. There's nothing for you where I come from. Go home. And they say, no, we're going to go with you. We're going to stick together. And she says to them again, no, look, really seriously. I'm, I'm done, she says to them. 
right? It's over for me. Um, go home. And, and they all start to cry. I, you know, crying you can't imagine. And as they're crying and crying and crying, Orpa starts to, she hugs her mother-in-law. She gives her a kiss and she says goodbye. And she turns and she goes back to her parents. But Ruth doesn't let go. And so now, so Naomi tries a third time and she says to, to Ruth, she says, look, she says, your sister-in-law just went. Right? She's the sensible one. She knows what this world is like. Go. But Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you to turn back and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. Thus and more may the Lord do to me if anything but death parts me from you. And that's the turning point. Right, right there in the first chapter, the, whole, the story's over in the first chapter. It's done. Because Ruth raised her hand. Because she said, this is it, this is my moment. Um, I don't have it in me to leave. Um, not because I'm deluded about what the world is like, not because I don't get what life is gonna be like for two widows on their own No, I, I get what that's going to be like. And that's why I can't leave. It's, um, I was thinking about for those of you, um, a few of you were, were at the Thursday morning Mishmar. Um, Right, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the cave, and he says to his son, Rabbi Elazar, Daila Olam Anivata. You and me, we're enough. Right, and, it, and it's as if Ruth is saying to Naomi, like, no, I'm not, I'm not a silly little girl. Like, I get how hard this is going to be, but at least we'll have each other. And, and, she's, in, and she's even yet in a different situation than Esther was, um, because Ruth has an out. But not only is Naomi not trying to get her to come. I, Naomi is ab above and beyond pushing her and pushing her and pushing her. Don't come back with me. And nobody faults Orpa. I mean, look in the commentaries. Nobody faults her for going back to her, to her parents. Because it was a reasonable decision. It, by a lot of measures, it was the prudent decision. Did you change your mind? What's that? What's that? Oh, okay. Ruth looks at this and she says, like, what am I supposed to do? This is, this is my moment. And, and this is our moment. Right. And, and like in the sense that um, I 
this pandemic with with all of its implications for us individually and as a Jewish community and as a nation and as a human race. This moment is ours. Um, and it's and it's not an accident or or a, a cosmic probability that it's that it's us. Um, we're we are here, right? Um, and the questions that I'm hearing as I talk to people. Are questions that needed to be asked. Um, questions about communal responsibility, questions about justice, questions about equity, um, questions about environmental stewardship, questions about the impact of individual decisions on larger groups of people. All of those questions needed to be asked last year and the year before and the year before that. Um, but they are, they're surfacing now. Right? And um, you know, so I was talking with a colleague shortly before Pesach, right? So what does that put that seven weeks ago? Um, so hard to believe this has been going on for so long, right? But seven weeks ago, I was talking with a colleague and and he said to me something that I had, he said out loud something that I had been feeling, which was that, you know, people, people were coming with this question of, you know, when are things going to go back to the way they were? Um, and, and what he said and what I had been feeling so profoundly was, well, but the way that things were, were so awful for so many people. Um, and, and not that I would want this situation of pandemic and quarantine to continue because it's also been terrible, but I, I don't want the world to go back to the way that it was. Um, and I, and I don't know, I don't know that I have an idea of what I think it should look like after either, but um, you know, would I like to go back to being able to have people in shul and sit at Kiddush and talk to people? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, do I want to go back to a situation in which healthcare is treated as a privilege? You know, in which job security is treated as a privilege and not a right? Um, I don't know. I do know. I don't. I don't want to go back to those things. Um, and, I don't, and I don't know what the path forward looks like. You know, what, what would it look like to emerge from this with greater economic equity, with greater healthcare equity, with greater racial equity? Um, but I think we shouldn't want things to go back to how they were. How they were wasn't good enough. And it's our, it's our moment to be Esther and it's our moment to be Ruth. More than Esther, it's our moment to be Ruth. Um, so I wanna, I wanna thank everyone for, for staying up and for, for coming to the end and to, um, I wanna bless each of us that in, in our own lives, um, at work and with our families and in our communities, our many overlapping communities, um, that we can find the courage to raise our hands. Yeah. Wish everyone a Chag Sameach and a good night. Sir Koa. Sir Koa, thank you. Good to see you, Noam.
Thank you. That was really um, beautifully said. Good to see you, Don. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank services you. are 9.30 tomorrow? Uh, no, so their BZBI is not holding services tomorrow. We'll have 9.30 on Saturday morning um, with the same Zoom link that you used to come on tonight. Got it. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right, yeah, Saturday service does include Yisker. You're at your class.